move on this. <laughs> what can I say? You can't touch that. You can't touch that. I mean, okay. Uh, anyway, the White Elephant Sale is going to be our September meeting. And I think most of you have probably seen it. But what we do is we'll have just a bunch of tables lined up in here. Uh, bring whatever you want to sell. Plants, pots, uh, tools, uh, display items, anything bonsai. Soil, oh, by the way, we've got five 40-pound bags of soil. No, yeah, we got a bunch of soil here. So for the next year, we've got soil to sell. And then, and then um, we were, uh, we uh, picked up a bunch of trees and pots. And that's, you saw, the, the online auction was one of those trees. It sold for $225, the, the, the Trident Maple. No, it worked. And it was a amount of time, so I Phil, had to it Phil won. <laughs> So uh, anyway, we will put a, another tree on, uh, another grove on. It's just as big. It's a pine. No, it's a spruce. Yeah. It's Rob, you saw. Rob, it's what, some you? type of spruce. Uh, they don't grow in Florida, so I don't know exactly, but maybe a Norway spruce or it's got really small needles. Yeah. And it's uh, no, it's not an Azo spruce. It's more like an American spruce of some type. Yeah, the same size pot, 24 by 36, and they're about four and a half feet tall. And no, thank you. you should have seen us bring it back from Columbus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are also six other plants and 25 pots, and I've got several golden. Ficus, golden leaf, what are they? Golden, golden gate. gate. Golden gate ficus. I have several of those. These are, you know, bonsai property. They'll be here. My wife has also told me I've got a lot to get rid of. <laughs> so I know I'll be bringing a lot of stuff. Uh, so anyway, bring your stuff. Come prepared to buy. It's always at a discount. The pots are... Don't ever buy a pot again. We've got pots to sell. Um, uh, so that's, that's in October, or that's in September. October, we just found out this week, well, we've been working on it for a couple of weeks. We're going to have an expert, uh, expert demo at the fall show. Okay, Sunday, October 2nd, we're going to have Jennifer Price, and she's going to do a demo on a, where are you? T TBD. Okay. But it's going to be dynamic. How's that? So she's going to do a demo on Sunday at the Crone. So come early. It'll be from, oh, you, could, you were going to say something about that. Oh. <laughs> setting up, um, well the Crone is setting up uh, an interview with some local media to get some excitement around the deal and then she will be with us afterwards. We're kind of working through the details but she will probably um, uh, critique trees that are uh, shown in the, uh, in the exhibit and then she will be with us on Sunday and she'll do like a really nice demo with a really nice tree that we're going to get and that tree will then live at the crone for the rest of who knows, it's yeah long. years and years and so if you don't know jennifer i mean she's awesome look her up on facebook she's one of the rising stars in bonsai and i think we're fortunate to get her mm -hmm. and she's been here so. twice over the last five years so joanne would you like to say a little bit about uh the fall show I, I, I know. I'm October 1st and 2nd, our annual fall show at the Crone. Uh, Friday, September 30th, all the people to help set up, or we will need people to help set up. And then at the end of the, sh and then at the end of the show, um, we'll need people to help tear down. And usually that takes maybe half hour, 45 minutes to do. Uh, we will 
ask for folks who can answer questions for people who, because usually it's very well attended, and people are at all, all, all the time asking questions, you know, pretty basic questions about bonsai, and if you could be there, and we'll have, you know, hello, my name is, so that they can identify you as bonsai, or you can get a shirt, a t-shirt like Phil's got, for, um, to, from the web, through the website, yeah. Or polo shirt. Polo shirts, t-shirts, whatever. And that would be really cool if, if we had those. Um, y you don't have to. Um, but if you can come and, and, you know, just for a couple hours, you know, answer questions. We will not have a raffle this year. Um, it's going to be a different setup because the current show is called Prismatica. It's really cool. They've got these seven foot prisms that are interactive and, and everything. We're going to have white curtains this year, kind of to play with the colors and everything with the prisms. It'll really look cool. Um, and um, two vendors, two vendors, uh, reminiscent herb farm and BC nursery, uh, Chris Dager, um, and the gift shop is also going to have some bonsai related items. They were showing me some of them, um, but they're going to have more. What else am I forgetting about it? You need to be a member um, to sign up to work, but yeah. And you also have to have a website account. So this kind of segues into what I was going to say. Okay. Yeah. Right. And I'll just edit myself. Yes. Out. I don't yes. need the mic. Um, questions. Okay. See you later. And you can also sign up tonight. We'll see, see Joanne and she can take your name. And, you know, if you haven't gotten onto the website yet. Yep. So. Uh, the website is up and running if you haven't been on there already. If you're a member and you have paid your dues already, but you do not have a website account, email me, webmaster at cincinnatibonsai.org. Use the contact page, let me know, and I will create an account for you. If you haven't renewed your membership for this year, please do so on the website. Uh, the website's going to be the home for everything uh, related to the club, so you'll be able to sign up for uh, volunteering slots uh, at the Crone Show. That's where you will also sign up uh, and register to bring your tree to the Crone Show. So if you're going to show some trees, you'll need to make sure you're set up on the website. Uh, we also have the shop that is currently on the website where you can order a number of different items, t-shirts, uh, we have aprons, baseball hats, uh, polo, embroidered polo shirts, lots of neat stuff. Um, what else? Oh, yeah. Raffle off. yeah raffle We're also raffling off tonight two uh, t-shirts. It's about a $30 value. Uh, chances are a dollar a piece. Six for five or 25 for 20. What, so, for those? Yeah. I thought we were just going to... Oh, we're just going to give them away? Well, well, we'll give everybody one ticket. Okay. We're, yeah. we're doing what he said. He didn't tell me that part. So, well, here, you take those then. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. All we're going to do is everybody will get one... I love this mic. <laughs> Everybody will get one right. raffle ticket. We'll pull them out, and we've got two shirts available for tonight. So we'll do that after we introduce Rob. So is there anything else? Yes, I forgot to mention the trees, and Julie is taking care of tech. If you want to have your trees in the, in the competition for the uh, fall show or just to display it in the fall show, um, Julie is the one that's, that's checking in trees. Check, check them in that Friday. Judging will start early on Saturday. I'm not sure exactly when it's going to be there, but um, it'll start early. So if, you should, if your tree is not in um, at the Chrome Friday, Friday by April 8th, um, then you will have trouble with it. Do you want to see some more trees? You're checking them in? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The goal is if you want to show a tree and where's it going? There will be a place uh, uh, form on the website where you can put in what tree you're going to bring, some details about the tree, uh, and that way we'll get our count of trees that are going to be in the show so we need to know how much that's I absolutely encourage every member that has some trees they want to show to do so. One, two, three, maybe. Um, yeah. yeah, I think last year we had over 50 trees. So we did. Uh, everybody, please put your tree in. And you know, if you want Jennifer to critique it, out. Yes, there's going to be on the form where you're putting in the details about any tree that you want to show, there's going to be a line where you can um, put down whether or not you want any tree critique. So that's commonly done at bonsai shows, where a professional will go around 
and look at particular trees and say what's wonderful about them, and maybe make some suggestions, maybe you want to turn up a little this for you, and consider this for the front, or make suggestions and basically critique it. And so you can put on your form if you would like to have your tree critiqued, and then that will occur during a specific, specified time, and that will be on the form. I think that'll be Sunday, like from 3 to 5 or something like that. But, yeah. Okay. Any questions? What's this Saturday? We got, oh, <laughs> we got the workshop Saturday. Uh, there are still places open. Did you want to say something? Okay. All right. There are a couple. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put a paper here. Somebody wants, we really, really want you to sign up on the website. But if for some reason that can't happen and you want to come to the workshop on Saturday, you can sign up right here. Okay. All right. Uh, workshop on Saturday. There's still a few seats open. If you'd like to come and have interaction with uh, Rob Kopinski, uh, It'd be great. You know, you can sign up tonight, say something to Phil, we'll get you signed up. So, no other questions? So, if, you, if you're going to show your tree at the Crone, this is a good workshop to come to. Yep. yep. So, it'll help sh teach you how to display your tree. Yep. Okay. So, our speaker tonight's Rob Kopinski. We, we spent the afternoon um, playing golf. He was four over and I was over that. <laughs> and, then we, and then we went out to lunch and I'll let him tell you about lunch. Um, it, was, it was a great Cincinnati lunch, so you all know where we went. Uh, so anyway, Rob is an in internationally known bonsai uh, expert. He travels the world, and I think he's been to all continents except Antarctica to display trees, only because Antarctica doesn't have anything that's green. So uh, he's, he's got lots of, uh, lots of trees, hundreds of trees that he sells. Uh, he, also has, he also has an affinity for old cars. But anyway, uh, he's going to speak about how to display how to display your tree for the upcoming show or just how to display it in your garden. So, Rob. All right, thank you. Thank you uh, for having me. I was actually here, I think it was eight years ago, but no one else was here for that? Was anyone else here for that display? Wow, that's a lot. Were you here, Evan? Okay, good, at least somebody. Was it about eight years ago? I remember carving a ball cypress tree and looking like I had massive dandruff. Speaking of massive dandruff, I had a three-way and a coney, yeah. and that cheese got everywhere. So it's like dandruff cheese, but it was actually very good. The chili had kind of like uh, allspice and maybe rosemary or something in it. It's a secret recipe. Secret recipe, yeah. I mean, uh, but I liked it, and I love to play golf. They call me the bonsai golfer, you know. And uh, I, uh, uh, I'm going to be talking about displaying bonsai, but I think I'm going to be doing it a little bit differently than what you expected, okay? So it's a kind of a broad discussion tonight, and, um, and I'll be referring occasionally to my book. So this is actually a second edition of my book, and um, I think it came out pretty good. And uh, it's 25 bucks on Amazon, but if you buy it tonight, it's only 20 bucks. You'll save five bucks plus the shipping, whatever shipping is nowadays. I only have 11, though, so uh, this one I keep as kind of my reference. Uh, I'd like to, I met most of you, I remember some of the names, not all of them, my memory's not as good. I used to be a fraternity rush term, and then if I drank beer, no problem with memories, but if I drank beer, then this presentation wouldn't probably be too good. Uh, so first, let's do a little exercise. How many people have 10 trees in their collection? 10. Yeah, stick your arm up. 
Who does? You don't have 10 trees in your? Oh, I have a lot more than 10. All right, well, that's, we're going to build up, OK? 10 trees, put your hand up. I want, how about 25 trees? All right, you don't have any trees? You just get? Less than 10. OK. That is remarkable restraint. My slogan is bonsai trees are like potato chips. Nobody can have more than just one, OK? 25 trees. Notice my hand is up. No, no more than 25. That's pretty good. How about 50? I see a couple 50s. How about 100? Uh-oh. We're going to have a competition here. I'm going 200. 200 in pots. And we'll, you have 200 trees in bonsai pots. You have more. You win. I probably tap out at around 225. Finished trees. Oh, they own a nursery. Oh. But I, I kind of do that to get a feel for the audience. How many people have been doing bonsai for more than five years? OK, how about 10 years? So I got some experienced people. All right, very good. I've been doing bonsai for 30 years. I started, uh, I'll get into it in my presentation. So that gives me kind of a feel for where we're at. And uh, let's see if I can get this thing to work. It's going to be a little awkward because it's got a weird mouse. I might have to actually sit up here, which I'm kind of energetic. OK, so this is one of my ficus trees that I grew from a cutting, believe it or not. That's what you can do in Florida. And I call this the Kraken, and it's a Ron Lang pot. And so we are talking about bonsai tonight, all right? So, but before we get into that, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. If, and I made that stand, too. I'm kind of, I do stands. I do a lot of different things. Let's go to the next one. This is kind of my background. In 1983, I was in the Army. I got stationed in Korea. And as part of one of the USO things, they sent us to the Korea house, and I saw bonsai trees. And fortunately, I took a picture, you know? And I thought they were really cool, but like most people, I thought bonsai tree was a certain specimen, you know, a species. I didn't realize it could be any tree in a pot. And um, 83, about 88, I started working on the space station program, because so I'm kind of a rocket scientist. And I worked with the Japanese space agency and started getting involved in their culture and made 32 trips to Japan, spent over a year in Japan. And decided to start doing bonsai trees. And as I said earlier, my slogan is they're like potato chips. Once you get one, you work on it, you got to leave it alone or you're going to kill it and get another one, get another one. Now I have 400 trees probably and 200 that are potentially show ready. So uh, I've also, uh, since I've been doing it 30 years, I've somehow became president of BCI. And that's how I met Evan and Dave Nowinski. He used to be our treasurer. And uh, through that, I made a lot of contacts. And that's and because I live in Florida, when I look at the literature available for bonsai trees, it's mostly about the temperate climate. It's either Japan or it's written from a New York kind of point of view, you know, that climate. And in Florida, we have a totally different climate. And we can do things in Florida a lot different. Like I showed you that ficus tree. That was basically, you know, 15 years to show. But, it, you know, it was a magnificent tree, which would probably take a lot longer up here in Cincinnati or New York. So I kind of wrote this book for that reason. It's called um, Growing and Appreciating Trees Around the World. And if you look at this, and I have the picture, it'll come up here, but if you look at this map, there's a lot of people in the tropical climates that are growing trees. Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, the Caribbean, South Africa. If you look at the east, east coast of South Africa, it's tropical. So there's a lot to learn by taking more than a, a point of view from your climate. Okay, think broadly. That's kind of my point, and that's what's in this book. And be because I have all these contexts, you'll see trees from magnificent trees from all over the world. I was able to get my friends and say, hey, send me some of your good trees from pretty much every continent, OK, except for Antarctica. Believe it or not, there was a bonsai tree in Antarctica. My company does government services, and we have the contract for the National Science Foundation to run the South Pole, Edmondson Station, Palmer Station, and McMurdo. And they had a greenhouse for toma fresh tomatoes, and they were growing a ficus in there. And uh, I worked like crazy to try to get a trip down to Antarctica to trim that ficus to say, I'm the only bonsai artist to trim a tree in every continent. They had some kind of blight, and it killed all the trees, and they, they fumigated and killed everything, and now there's no more bonsai tree in Antarctica, which is kind of a bummer. You know? Next one. So we are talking about bonsai. Does anybody know what those things on the upper left are? No, uh, it's kanji, not kanji. hiragana. Okay, kanji. It's Japanese characters, actually the Chinese characters that say bonsai. And it literally means 
if you translate it literally, which you really can't, it'd be like translating father as the fat her, you know? It doesn't really make sense. But bonsai, the first character means uh, container, and the second character sort of means living in. And that's another one of my trees, an Iliagnus and a Dale Kochoy pot. He's an Ohioan. He's no longer with us, unfortunately. And another stand that I made. So we're going to talk a little bit about displaying bonsai. And my, next one, please. My definition of, OK, I already covered that. You know, it's a global art, different trees from all over the world. Uh, obviously, you can have sizes. That's one of my trees in the upper, uh, your upper left. That's a, an Australian pine, small tree, commonly called in Japanese. Anybody know the Japanese word for small tree? Shohin, right? I occasionally use a Japanese word because sometimes they're, they're simpler. But if I, if I do happen to use a Japanese word, just ask me what it means in English. I try to use mostly English. Uh, that tree in the middle is a medium size. That, that is one of my Florida elms. It's an American elm that grows in Florida. It's not susceptible to Dutch elm disease, which is nice. I collected that and, and styled it myself. Sarah Raina Pot. And then that one I can't claim. That is a tree in the Japanese Imperial Garden. I had the privilege of visiting the Japanese Imperial Garden bonsai collection. I actually had my mom with me on that trip. She was around during World War II. And she's roaming around the Japanese Imperial Palace. She's no longer with us. She died a year and a half ago. But she said, Never in my life did I think I'd be inside the Japanese Imperial Palace. You know, they were basically the enemy from my mom's point of view. So it's good that bonsai has a connection that brings people together, particularly on a global scale. Uh, next chart, please. The artistic grammar of bonsai, you know, you uh, do have different styles. There's the formal upright, there's a slanting forest, you know, uh, cascade. But you know what? Trees don't really care what a style is. That is an human convention. I mean, look at Google. They're trying to catalog everything, right? Humans like to do that. Trees just want to grow. And you can force them to do whatever you want. Uh, next. So here's what I mean when I talk about display. First thing is, where do your trees spend 99.9% .9 of their time? In your garden, right? I mean, I, I have 200. One of the reasons I'm getting rid of a lot of my trees is I'm not going to live long enough to put them all in shows. There's just not enough shows to show all the trees I have, right? So most of the trees are in your garden. So you really, the first thing we're going to talk about is how do you display your tree in your garden so that it's not an eyesore? You know, I've been to a lot of collections where it's just a bunch of big mess. There's weeds and whatever. I think you should spend most of your time in display worrying about what the trees look like in your garden. Next is how do you have trees for personal enjoyment? There's a concept in Japan called the tokonoma. We'll get into that, OK? I don't really see too many people here that look Japanese or have Japanese. Anybody have any Japanese extraction? No. Anybody have a tokonoma in their house? No. OK, so we'll talk about that. Permanent displays. There are a lot of permanent displays in the world. Uh, the Crone is one, right? And there's the National Arboretum, and there's the Warehouse, or forget what, the Pacific Garden. And uh, we used to have one in our local zoo. Photographing trees, I think, is a, cre a key skill that bonsai artists should know to develop a record. And I'll give you some tips on how you photograph trees tonight. And then finally, I think we're getting to what everybody thought I was going to talk about, and that's <laughs> exhibition and show. OK? I want to, can I get in on the game, too? Absolutely. <laughs> I might get lucky. You never know. All right. So let's get on to talking about garden for growth. I have to be on the bullet train in Japan going somewhere. And I looked out. Luckily, I had my camera. And I saw that. That's somebody's backyard. First of all, this person is very fortunate because in Japan, they got a big backyard. That's not cheap. I can tell you right now, Japanese real estate is very expensive. Of course, Florida real estate after COVID became outlandishly expensive. But um, what do you see there if you just quickly look at that garden? You know, would you, would you like to have that garden? Why? The trees look nice. And it appears that they have a... Uh, a little display tokonoma right there, not the traditional type of tokonoma because it's an outdoor thing. And uh, you know, they have some shade, which, which is beneficial for some trees and not. But it's really more of a production nursery, in my opinion. This is a person gone wild if they're a personal collector. <laughs> they have a lot of nice trees, but they have too many trees. So let's, let's talk about this. So here's a production nursery. Is that aesthetically pleasing? Does anybody's backyard look like a production nursery? You probably don't want to admit it if it does. It's OK, in my opinion, to have a production nursery off to the side, because not all trees are ready for show. Okay, 
you can't, but you really should think about how am I going to display my trees in the most optimum way for the tree's health and also for aesthetic enjoyment. Something to really think about. Next. I'm staying with Brandon and he's getting there. He's got a little Zen garden on the side and he's got some benches, but we can work on the design to make it better. How'd you like to have that as your backyard? Too many, Too many right? <laughs> now this guy, uh, this was a billionaire, a Japanese billionaire. He's no longer with us and unfortunately the whole thing got taken apart by his descendants. However, it's well presented. It's a hobbyist gone wild. He had 40,000 bonsai trees. A crew of 12 taking care of them. Let's go to the next one. I'll show you some more of his collection. Those are some of his aesthetic trees. But you go there, and you're, the only thing you're blown away by is the volume, you know? Next. Again, same guy's backyard, you know? So uh, let's look at the next one. Uh, now, this is getting a little bad. This is the same garden, but at least he's done a couple of things. He's put. These are like Hukufu 10 winners. These are superb trees. These are multi-thousand, maybe up to $100,000 trees. And they're at least on a little concrete pedestal. Those are neat. They have those in Japan. They don't have those in America that I've seen. What's nice about them, they don't rot. So you, in Florida, when we make pedestals out of wood, they just don't hold up. You know, they rot out. But, you know, he's, he's sort of getting to more of a, the tree is a work of art, and it's got its own display. Okay? So let's go to the next chart. This was an interesting concept. Same guy, he decided to bury his bonsai pots in a little hill. But at least now he's going for a kind of a natural look. This is getting to be more like a gallery, a bonsai gallery, okay, in your display garden. Next. This one I had to throw in there because this is also the Imperial Palace. This, was not, this is not meant for public viewing. What the Imperial Palace does is they grow all these trees, and these are big trees. I call them imperial size. They, um, when they get the President of the United States, like when, when Trump was over in Japan talking to, um, wasn't talking to the Japanese, he was talking to Putin or whatever, the, the Imperial Palace actually set up bonsai trees in the background. I took a photograph of a screenshot of it because it was kind of cool. And it's interesting when, when people want to be somewhat sophisticated and cool, they use a bonsai tree. You know, I was re I'm reading a science fiction book about these guys in space, and the author took time to talk about the guy who was growing a bonsai tree in the spaceship. I thought that was pretty cool. I said, I'm going to look this guy up to see if he's into bonsai. But that, that's a pretty nice collection, even though it's not meant for personal view. Next. But now we're getting to maybe having a backyard display where you're growing trees, you're taking into account the health of the trees, the light needs, but you're trying to do it in, a, in an aesthetic way. This is probably still a little bit crowded. This was in Austria. Uh, go ahead. But here, this is a friend of mine in Orlando. Now, he spent a lot of money on this garden, millions, OK? But it is a gallery, OK? All the trees have plenty of room. They're not crowded. They're, he likes mostly large trees. I just had surgery to repair myself from picking up big trees. So I'm by myself. You know, I need, I need a robot to help me. He, he actually bought a little mechanical forklift. But you can stroll through that garden and get a really good feel. And you can appreciate the trees for what they are, really works of art. Okay, next. Ben. That's Ben, yeah. Ben. yeah. Yeah, he's quite the character. This is not Ben, this is Switzerland, okay? This guy has, he has gone and collected every one of these trees. It's Peter Talley. He's collected every one of these trees, I haven't heard from him in a while, from the wild and has displayed them in kind of a museum setting, you know? It's not overcrowded, plenty of room for the trees, and you can go out and kind of appreciate the aesthetic. To me, that's much better than that house that I snapped on the train, you know? Now, this is Mr. Kobayashi's museum in Japan, Shunkanen. It's called the Bonsai Museum. And you can see that, again, he's used heavy-duty timbers because these are big trees and displayed them in kind of a museum setting. What you can't see is in this building right here, and it kind of makes an L shape, he has built, uh, I forget exactly how many, 12 traditional tokonomas, the, the Japanese display niche. And there's different sizes. I have a few pictures of them coming later. But that's a museum. And you know, that is, he sold supposedly one tree to build this museum. He has boards in the ceiling of one of those token rooms. He told me each board was $10,000. So you can imagine what he sold that tree for. In Japan, tree can go for big money, particularly now the Chinese are buying a lot of them at crazy prices. Next, this is a little niche 
in Mr. Kobayashi's corner. Actually, in the back, he does have a little production area in, right in front of this. But the point is that he did uh, set aside, you know, a nice little grow area, but also a display area. So what do we notice about that? Lighting is pretty good. Trees aren't crowded. Trees are kind of tall, right? The pedestals are kind of tall, so that the trees are at eye level, right? What else do you notice about them? Some of them are tied down. I guess they're all tied down. I have to do that with some of mine. Uh, particularly cascades, you do want to tie them down. And when, when trees are at that height and you have rocks at the bottom of the ground, you better tie them down. So that's not a no-no in my opinion, tying trees down. I probably have 10 trees that I know that occasionally get blown over by the wind. I have them tied down. There are also accessories. There are accessories. Yeah, he's got Mondo grass and he has apprentices that clean all the clippings up. I don't have that. Around my garden, I typically, I have stuff that looks like that. My neighborhood, being in Florida, where they had these things called covenants. I don't know if they have them up here. They're like communists. You know, they have all these rules. We can't have a fence in our, in our neighborhood. HOAs. HOAs, yeah, the HOAs have covenants. So uh, I have mulch, and then when I cut leaves, instead of picking them up, I just let them compost, you know. It still looks okay. But think about that. You can put some rocks around your trees. You can put some mondo grass or whatever. Um, he does have full-size trees providing a little bit of shade. And this tree would like to shade. These two really, well, that's an azalea. That would be okay in the shade. That one would not. And it looks like that one is getting more sun, you know? So again, this is the display of bonsai. The point to take from this is think about how you can make your backyard more aesthetically pleasing, you know? And because you're going to be the one enjoying it when you have people come over. You know, like in my yard, I probably should have put a picture of my yard. I actually have a little path with a bridge and a stream, and I have maybe 20 trees here and 20 trees there. And then I actually built a, uh, what I call the garden gate. Ben Oki was in my yard one time, and it, it does look like a Shinto gate. And he says, do you burn crosses in your front yard? <laughs> I said, why would you say that, Ben? He goes, well, why do you have a Shinto gate in your backyard? I said, oh, that's not a Shinto gate. That's just the garden gate. <laughs> but it looks like a Shinto gate, and I painted it gray. So... I think it's important to spend time, if, if you have too many trees, sell some trees and spend the money on your garden, okay? Next. This is an interesting one. This is Mr. Morbay. He's Sean Smith really likes Mr. Morbay. He's a great guy. But in his garden, he built this little shed. What do you think is inside that shed? Can a bonsai tree, first of all, live in a shed? No. He has a dead bonsai tree in that shed. He permanently built that shed to display, and that's the poetic name of the tree, I forget what it is, but it's an old shimpaku, it's thousands of year old, and it died on him. Even the masters, you know, have dead trees. And he just displays the dead tree in that shed. But it is aesthetically pleasing. You know, that maple forest is phenomenal. So let's move on. It wasn't a picture of the tree. <laughs> nah, because it's just a bunch of dead wood, you know. I, I, uh, even though I love Japan and I, uh, it's one of my favorite places to go to and I can speak Japanese and I, I'm not, there, it's still, I'm American, you know, I'm not Japanese and so I don't get too excited over a dead piece of wood. Unless it's mahogany, I'm making a stand or something out of it. Um, that's a permanent display in the U.S. Anybody know where that one is? Uh, yeah, the National Gallery. That's the National Arboretum, yeah. And these are all trees donated by mostly, well, there's Americans, there's the Chinese exhibit, and there's a Japanese exhibit. At the Bicentennial, the Japanese gave Americans a lot of trees, including that big um, white pine that supposedly was at, well, was at Hiroshima, and it was behind the wall. The bomb was that way, and the wall basically protected the tree. And now that's in the National Arboretum, the big, fat, white pine. Next. This is a beautiful garden. Anybody know where that is? It's in the U.S. Has anybody been there? Portland. Southern California, the tip. It's the Huntington. If you ever get to L.A., make sure you go to the Huntington. What I am blown away by the Huntington is the spaciousness of the display. How many bonsai trees do you see in that display? One. <laughs> that's something, you know. That really puts a lot of emphasis, and that's Ben Oki's tree. He did that juniper. And then he, they do have a viewing stone. Some people are into the stones. I tell people I've been into stones right before I got married because I ended up buying all these ones that go on my wife's fingers, you know? <laughs> Luckily, she ran out of appendages, so we're not buying too many more stones. Next. <clears throat> this one's in Omiya. I think you were telling me that you went to Omiya. You're trying to remember the name. Yeah. This is a bonsai museum in Omiya. See how spacious it is? 
You know, they, they have plenty of room to enjoy the trees. The lesson to be learned is don't crowd your bench. It's good for the trees. It's good for the aesthetics. Okay? All right, next. Now we're going to talk about indoor display because uh, displaying a tree indoors can bring a lot of pleasure. I mean, I do it all the time. And I'll show you a couple of pictures of what we've done. But in Japan, uh, started with the samurais, they have these little niches inside their house that are called tokonomas. Not to, not to be confused with tokonoma. Same spelling in English except for the last letter. They were basically, for the samurais of the 15 and 1600s, they were large TV. They didn't have different things, and they weren't always bonsai, by the way. They would bring in, like in, in New Year's, they'd bring in a pine branch in a little setting, and they would sit there and contemplate their navel while looking at this thing. And they would get in, you know, meditation, and the, the buildings that they do the tea ceremonies in this little niche. But none of us have that in the United States, right? Most Japanese homes, even if they live in a small one-room apartment, will have a little alcove this big. And they may have a, a, a memorial to their ancestor, or they may bring in, uh, like if it's Children's Day, they'll put something in for the holiday or whatever. We don't really do that in the US, OK? Some people, though, are really into it, and they do do tokenomas. Let's go on to the next one. So there's really a couple of different types of tokenomas. The, these are Japanese words. I put them in English. It's all refined. It has distinctive trays. But notice, there's no bonsai in that one, right? Japanese don't always do, do bonsai. Even though bonsai is a Japanese word, and for a lot of people do it, it's still a, um, you know, we play golf, millions of golfers in, in Japan. There's probably. 200,000 bonsai artists, you know? So it's still a French hobby in Japan. It's actually more popular in China, believe it or not. Uh, Digo is kind of in between, and the so would be in the front. Has anybody ever seen Bill Belvanis's tokenoma, pictures of it? He has that irregular log on the side. That would make that an informal tokenoma because he's using rustic logs. Next. So this one is kind of an in between one, uh, although the thing on the right to me looks very formal with the shoji screen and stuff. But that is a bonsai that you know, someone is using, and um, they're using a scroll. So again, none of us really have these tokenomas, but you take advantage of them, right? Next. This one is uh, interesting. You know, people say there's certain rules that the scroll has to point this way, and it can't be interfering with the, uh, with the tree. And you have to have an odd number of things. How many objects do you see in that one? Four. Four, right? Has anybody ever told you four is a bad number in Japan for stuff, right? Yeah. It, Why should it be three? Why should it be three? This, what I'm saying is Japan is not a monolith. I've been there a long time. I've worked with them. There's lots of variety in Japan. When people say this is how the Japanese do it, question them on it. They do a lot of different things. This guy liked that little statue with this, who knows what that thing is. And he, he put it, what it would, many would consider a massive scroll with the tree, right? It's kind of dominating it. but. It's a personal expression. And like when people say, well, when you do a show-in stand, you got to have little stands underneath it. No, you don't. You can do whatever you want. And we're going to get to that. Next. This one's a very simple one. This is in Mr. Kobayashi's garden. And uh, how many items do you see there? That's a typical three-point display. Uh, do, you familiar with the concept of the golden mean? You know, like the way our teeth, our main teeth are bigger and a little bit smaller. They get progressively smaller based on the golden mean, 0.62. Well, when you, when you put something in a display, notice that thing is not exactly halfway. It's a little bit more this way, and the center of mass is probably at the golden mean. Then if you look at the proportions of this area, it's the golden mean compared to the proportions of that. So when you put stuff in a display, which we'll talk about later, we don't have too many stands here, but use the golden mean. Never, very rarely would you put something in the middle of the table. There are some occasions where you could do it if you think it looks aesthetically pleasing. But let's go to the next one. <coughs> this one was Matt Real. He just posted this on Facebook. I hope he doesn't mind me using his picture. But um, again, from what I've heard people say in demos and stuff, it's violating a lot of rules. The scroll is way too big, right? The tree is, is really sumac, which is kind of cool. I like sumac. It doesn't grow in Florida, but I think it would grow here. Do you have sumac? 
It can be poisonous too, though. You have to be, make sure you get the right one. And, um, but what was interesting about this one is Matt had a concept in mind before he made the display. He was trying to recreate a season. That's a very fair example of a concept. And we're going to talk more about concepts in a second. Looks like he built some type of informal tokenoma in his, wherever he's living. I, th I think he lives out in uh, Oregon, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Portland. Portland. OK, there's a lot of guys that are living in Portland now. It's a little uh, Matt and um, Michael Hagedorn and Ryan, a couple others too. Randy Knight lives there. Let's go to the next one. It's pretty. This is my house. I don't have a tokenoma, but I do have an island like this in my kitchen with the sink right here. And it, it gets my wife mad because she says ants come off the trees or whatever. But I regularly set up a tree on my kitchen counter. And every time I go in to get a snack, because I work out of my house. I've been working out of my house for 17 years. I, uh, you know, I get to enjoy a tree without having to go out. Americans have a kitchen, right? You could, and there's water there. And if you make a mess, it's easy to clean up. So think about that, and that's our, you know, that's our oven in the background. Next. All right, photographing trees. Before we get into photographing, any questions about indoor display? Anybody have any? Yeah. How long would you uh, have a, a token display? Uh, how long would you bring your tree in to display it, right? Yeah, the, actually, have you ever been in a cave? Go to a cavern somewhere. How many trees did you see inside a cave? None. A house is a cave to a tree. Unless you provide grow lights, uh, you can't keep them more than a couple of days. Uh, I had a tree, uh, a clerodendron, in the Florida show for three days over this past Memorial Day weekend. I watered it all. I lost the top of the tree. It just, the air conditioning basically cooked the tree. Or it didn't cook the tree. It's a tropical. It didn't like, you know, the 68 degree air. So, yeah, don't leave them inside too long. Bring them in for a couple of days. Like when I do the kitchen bonsai, it's one day. I bring it in the morning until my wife comes home for whatever she's doing. She starts complaining. I take it out, you know. <laughs> she runs a show. But I'm home all day, so I got the trees in the kitchen. I'm enjoying them. And, and there are occasionally an or two. Uh, so photographing trees. I have a lot on photographing trees because I think it's kind of cool for, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, number one, you want to you wanna record the splendor of the tree. You can enjoy it, you know, by looking at your pictures on your phone or on your computer. It's also good for prosperity. I mean, face it, you know, eventually we all have to get rid of our trees because we can't take care of them anymore, you know, and the trees will outlive us. But if you have a photographic record of the trees, they stay with you, okay? So I would highly encourage people to maintain a photographic record of your trees, and that's what we're going to talk about now. That's my tree, by the way. That's, uh, that was about 20 years ago. That tree's over 100 years old. It was imported, Japanese black pine, imported into the U.S. after World War II when it was still legal. And... Uh, I think it's even better now, but uh, I had to restyle it. Let's, let's go. Uh, another reason is flowers don't last forever. So now I got, I got lucky. This was a handheld shot at the National Arboretum. And the lighting was perfect, and it, it came out to be a, no tripod or anything. Pretty good shot. And even though it's not my tree, I've enjoyed that picture a lot. OK? It's even in my book. Next. This is another. You know, these maples, these Japanese maples, their, their leaves change colors over the season. So if you have a photographic reminder, and then you can start putting them one next to another, it's kind of a neat thing to have. This was Mr. Iwasaki's tree. He let me use some photos from his book. When, when I took my mom to Japan, we also went to Mr. Iwasaki's uh, garden. He was the same age as my mom. He's a billionaire. And he gets up to make a speech, and he basically says, He's still fertile and ready to reproduce. He's like 89 years old when he says this. And everybody, I can speak Japanese. I'm thinking, I can't believe he said it. Then he comes up to my mom, who had just become a widow, and kisses her out of the clear blue. And my, but then he gave my, wife, my mom his book. And they sell for three grand on eBay. So I was telling my mom, you don't really want that book, do you, mom? <laughs> no, you can have it. And she gave me the book. So I have Iwasaki's book. And he gave me permission to, um, to use uh, photos from it. He used to call me Nasa no Kenchan. Kenchan's my Japanese nickname. And when you put a no on a word in Japanese, it means possessive, like, because I'm a rocket scientist and I work for the space station. I thought it was a pretty cool nickname. Kenchan from Nasa. Next, even though I never worked for Nasa, I just worked on their programs. This is a really good reason to take pictures of trees, I think. See how they change over the season. You kind of forget from day to day that they're always changing. But if you can do in Photoshop, put them together like that, it's pretty neat, you know? Next. 
historical. Click a couple times, this is a little animation. This was a little crepe model I had. And you can see how the tree has changed over time. And it's kind of interesting. And maybe it gives you an idea on how you want to continue to change it. OK, next. Diagnostic role. So once, this is one of my ficus trees. Once I saw this photo, believe it or not, I removed that branch. I felt like that branch was too low and it was putting too much emphasis on it. That's a willow leaf ficus, by the way. Is that a question back there? No? OK. Next, virtual design. You can't believe anything you see on the internet anymore, all right? I'm getting really good with Photoshop. I mean, if I told you what I did, like this in my backdrop. So it's actually two photos spliced together. You can't tell, you know? So you have to be really careful about what you see online. But, and I've done a lot of these online for people just as a favor. This is not my tree. And the guy says, how would this look? I put it in a pot, put it on a stand, added foliage, and said, this is a future idea. Because you do have to see a future plan when you're looking at a tree. So virtual designs, you can do them in Photoshop or whatever you know, tools you have. They're, they're very handy for uh, displaying trees. Another reason is, you know, not everybody can go to your garden. So this is a guy, Clay Gratz, he's a great cartoonist. I say, can you make this cartoon for me? And so there's plenty of ways on the internet through Facebook, through discussion groups, through blogs. I have a blog and it became too much work. You can show your trees off, you know, and you can get, you can share and get feedback from a lot of people. So next, you know, like I said, you can share them on the internet. Next, that center tree, but relax your eyes and you're going to see a 3D image. It does work. I just did it in, uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds. You have to stare at the middle tree, relax your eyes, kind of look at the background. Do you see 3D? Is it happening for anybody? It might be too far. I don't know. You might have to be. Oh, Brandon saw it. I saw it when I did it. I can't do it from this angle because I'm too oblique. Anyway, um, I haven't really messed around with that. I, forget, I think Adam gave me a picture. I can't remember. Next. Mentioned that when you want to be cool, you use a bonsai. This was a screenshot from a commercial. That's why it's kind of blurry. And you see this a lot. The movie Dune. Did anybody see the most recent movie Dune? Did you notice when he's having breakfast with his mother, there are two bonsai trees in that scene. And uh, it's, it's pretty cool. And they're nice bonsai trees. And the Karate Kid, those bonsai trees were a main part of the show. They were provided by Roy Nagatoshi for that movie. I don't know if you guys have ever had Roy come over. He's, he's getting up there in age now. shot. This is in Chicago. They're, I think they're having their show this weekend, right? Yeah. Next. The value of a good photograph. That is not a good photograph for a couple of reasons. Go to the next one. So number one, the backdrop, although it's plain, is a bit of distraction. Uh, the shadows are not good. It's the shadows on the pots. The trunk is kind of dark. It's on a stand. And uh, it has, even though it has a, I like the tie-dye backdrop. Not everybody does. But one thing that bugs me about Bill Valvanis' show is he has great photographs of the trees. They all have a black backdrop. And when you look at a book and every page is a black backdrop, I think your eyes get tired really fast. And like in my book, I intentionally did not do that. I intentionally have some black, different colors. You know, I try to make it pleasing to the eye, keep your eye going. So that's why I like my tight eye. I have different color backdrops. Next. Uh, this is a garden shot. What do you think about that photo? What was that? You said something good. I heard you say something. Well, but why not? What's There you go. It's blending into the ivy, right? So as a diagnostic tool, it doesn't do much for you because it's hard to tell where the tree is and where the tree isn't. Um, for a diagnostic, you know, for a status shot or whatever, if you're trying to sell the tree, maybe it would work. But really, for, for documenting the tree, it's not a good way to go. Next, you got to do what it takes. Like, this is a handheld shot that I took at a show in Prague where I was a judge. And uh, it's not a great shot because it's handheld. You know, I couldn't do a tripod and set up lights. The shadows are bad. But <laughs> is that even worth it? You know? We'll talk more about that in, in a little bit. There's another one where, again, 
there's Jesus in there, so I don't want to say too much because it wasn't a monastery. It was kind of a neat place. And they actually put my wife and I up in this monastery. And it was so cool. We had a two-level room with these 500-year-old beams. It was kind of neat. Uh, I have been so lucky that I got all these different experiences from Onsai. And uh, kind of funny, when we went to go pick up our key, they had three envelopes. And one thing nice about Eastern Europe is Kempinski is no problem for those people. So we had Mr. Kempinski, Mr. Garner, and Mr. Nobody. And my wife and I are saying, who the heck is Mr. Nobody? <laughs> they probably didn't know the guy's name, but they knew they needed to leave a key. They called him Mr. Nobody. And this is a cascade, very tricky to photograph cascades, um, but the lighting is a little better. It must have been near a window, but the light's obviously coming in from this one side. Um, again, kind of a feeble attempt at a two-point display. Now, how about this photograph? What do you think? This is an American tree by uh, Marty Schoenberger. He let me use it. It's a pretty good photograph, right? The only thing I don't like about this photograph is this white bar here where they folded over the paper and it reflected. It's a little bit distracting to me. That could have been easily cleaned up in Photoshop. But there's no sh notice there's no shadow behind the tree. The black backdrop has a tendency to hide that. But they did use side lighting. So let's go to the next one. How about that photograph? Notice how you know, the photograph makes the tree really pop. It's a plain backdrop. I think it's a digital backdrop. Not sure. This was from the Philippines. This is a Pemphis acidula, phenomenal trees. And um, we'll talk about it, but notice how the camera focal point is basically just a little bit below the top of the pot, which is pretty good for a cascade. You want the center of mass to be right. That's where you're aiming your camera. We'll, we'll talk more. Good, good photograph. Phenomenal photograph. But look at the shadows underneath the pot, uh, underneath the um, stand. What does that tell you about the lighting? The light was on both sides. So that's a, that's a technique for photographing bonsai trees. Put the light on both sides of the tree. It eliminates the shadow in the back. Okay, And um, you don't need expensive lights. I bought these little incandescent lights from Home Depot. I basically have a 120 watt light bulb in there. And then I use a little spotlight in the bottom. And I leave my overhead lights on. And I get pretty good photo. That's not my photograph. That's, uh, I think that's Mr. Su's tree, professionally photographed in Taiwan. Next. I think it's a uh, hackberry. OK, when you're taking a picture of a tree, you're not really looking for fine art. There's nothing wrong with fine art, but that's not really what you're shooting for when you're trying to document the tree. Okay, hit the button again, please. You're trying to document the tree. Do it again. That's probably one of the best bonsai trees in the world, in my opinion. That's Minshan Lowe's. Ficus microcarpa, okay? And uh, his father started that tree 70, 80 years ago. And, I mean, I think Taiwan has the best bonsai trees in the world. I know it's up for debate, but they grow the kind of trees that I can grow. They do amazing things with them, and that's one of them. But Mr. Lowe has a side business of, of taking photos of trees, and he has in his shop three different backdrops that can roll down kind of like that thing right there with different colors. So if you go to the next one, he has dark, he has light, even. So that's his tree. That's a Chinese pistachio. Mr. Lowe, by the way, is one of the best artists in the world, kind of like Suthin is in America. The stand, I think that's OK to do when you're documenting the tree. You're not really, the stand is gorgeous, but you're really focusing on that great tree. And I also like how the stand matches the color of the, the new shoots on that Chinese pistachio. So a couple of things. When you want to take a picture of a tree, it's got to be ready. I mean, if, as long as it's an exhibition type photo, it's got to look good. OK, it's got to be presentable. Uh, next, you do have to clean the pot. He did leave some patina on the pot, though. This is probably an old Chinese pot. I asked him, how can I get some of these big Chinese pots? And he said, they won't survive the trip over. They're low fired. You know, like this pot right here probably would crack, and you'd be wasting a lot of money. It's kind of a bummer. Uh, don't have weeds. I made Brandon take some weeds off one of the trees he was bringing in tonight. If it's an exhibition, you're not going to have weeds. It, it bugs me to no end when I see weeds in trees and guy wires, too. Don't have a guy wire. It's OK to have wiring on your but don't have a guy wire. If you have a guy wire on your tree, it's not ready for display. 
If you cut the guy off and the branch snaps up, it's not ready. Sorry, don't put it in shell. Uh, you should put moss. I'm not a big, I mean, I like moss on the tree because in my opinion, the moss simulates the earth and it helps set the illusion of the tree. But it, a lot of people have trouble growing moss. I don't because I use a micro sprinkler. Uh, again, they cropped the stand. I think it's okay. Well, that's the same picture. Sorry. Next, I think there's one more thing that I mentioned is don't water the tree. Why do you think you don't want to water the tree right before you take a picture? It's the, the, the moisture is going to speculate the image and reflect light and, and destroy the image. You want the tree to be dry. I'm not saying the soil to be dry. I mean the tree to be dry. No water on the leaves, no water on the trunk. And believe it or not, I keep a hair dryer in my, in my garage where I photograph, and I'll dry the trees if they're wet to, to make sure that they're, they're looking flat, as in uh, not flat this way, but matte, you know, matte finish. Next. Use a stand. We don't have many stands today for our display, but why, why is it important to use a stand, do you think? There's a couple of reasons. Number one, most tables are about 32 to 34 inches tall, right? Our eyes, you know, anywhere from five feet to seven feet, whatever. If you just put a tree on a table, you're going to have to do this. That's awkward for the viewer. Trees are ideal when they're viewed, when the plane of the view really is right above the pot. So you need a stand for that. And when, you, when you're um, displaying a tree, particularly as your show comes up, you need stands. And you know, since I'm a woodworker, I just made all my stands. I got probably 100, and I have them in different sizes, all the way up to almost as big as this table, because I used to have a really big buttonwood. So, uh, and there's different styles of stands. I don't think you have to get too hung up on the style. What's really more important is that the pot size is uh, smaller than the top of the stand, and you have at least 30% extra on both sides. That stand is just barely big enough for that tree, in my opinion. But it is big enough. Okay? That's Tony Tickle, I believe, or his buddy. That's a U from uh, YEW. I think you can grow them here from the UK. Next. Okay, let's skip that one. I mean, I said use a backdrop. That's a great tree. That will look even better without a backdrop. I mean, with a backdrop, you know? Next. Do what it takes. <laughs> I was in Nanjing. And, and China doesn't get the credit for the, the, they did have the Cultural Revolution where Mao Zedong screwed up bonsai, basically. They destroyed a lot of them. But the Chinese people know how to do bonsai. And um, that is a, uh, probably that's a ficus or a, a hackberry. I can't remember. If it's Nanjing, it's probably a hackberry. And look what they did. They brought a temporary backdrop out there in the garden, you know. Next. Plain white is always good for a backdrop. You have to watch the exposure. That's Robert Stevens. He's, he's a good friend of mine. Next. Dark plastic can work, but it wrinkles. I wouldn't recommend dark plastic. It is cheap, though, and you can get it in big sheets, right? Uh, next. Pure black. That, that was the edition one of my book. That was the cover shot. That's a, I call that button with the tsunami button wood because this little wood here, remind, this little curve reminded me of a tsunami wave until I visited India after the tsunami hit. And I realized tsunami is not a good thing. So I kind of downplayed it. Next. That's my tie-dye. That's another one of my buttons. I actually sold that to a friend of mine. Just I couldn't move it anymore. It's just too big. I call that one Dante's Inferno. Yeah, next. He changed the front. I think he destroyed the tree. But sorry, I hope he's not listening to this video. Uh, color gradient. They actually sell these in photography shops if you want to get a small one where you can get a color gradient, or you can do that in Photoshop if you're good. You can do a gradient. Next. But notice the color is on the opposite side of the color wheel. So uh, gray wall. This is Walter Paul. He does all of his photos in front of a gray wall when it's overcast outside. So he doesn't get shadows. And he takes pretty good photos, you know? Next. That's Min Lo. That's one of his um, uh, green backdrops. And that is a Malpighia. I've seen some, I think, you have a mouth pig here, right? This is one of the reasons, uh, Barbados cherry. Oh, yeah. yeah, I actually collected some in Mexico that were phenomenal in the Yucatan. I didn't bring it home, I gave it to people, but you know, he grew that from a cutting. He's just a phenomenal artist. Wow. Notice how he breaks a lot of the rules though. He's, the birds gotta fly through, all the branches gotta be parallel to the ground, right? Uh-uh. There's a lot of different things you can do if you're free-spirited. Next. Are you defoliating just for photographs? You can do that. In Taiwan, they do photograph, they do defoliate for most shows. Well, that normally is always in winter, 
Yeah, you defoliate it. In tropical trees, you can defoliate. In Taiwan, in particular, they're right above the Tropic of what, Capricorn, I think. They can defoliate year-round. I can defoliate most trees year-round. That can be defoliated. I wouldn't defoliate a black pine. But ficus trees or buttonwoods. Buttonwoods, I wouldn't defoliate a buttonwood or a um, Brazilian rain tree in, my, you know, in the winter in my neighborhood because it does get a little bit cold. We get down to 40, you know, freezing. He was telling me, you get up to 40 in the winter. <laughs> Next. Avoid busy banners. That was a pretty cool tree, but that was the entrance to his show. And it, I don't, I'm not sure what those, I guess those little slash things were intentional. They almost look like Christmas ornaments. Next. There's your tokenoma again. Actually, it's very tough to photograph a tree in a tokenoma because you can't really get the lighting where you need it. So I think for this one, I didn't have a tripod, but I used a very slow shutter speed and somehow got lucky that it wasn't blurry. Next. Virtual backdrops. That, that's my tree that lives in Mexico. I keep it in Enrique's house. And I go there every so often to work on it, but I can't get into America. That's a black olive. So anybody recognize that backdrop? Olive is the key term. That's Van Gogh's painting yeah, of the olive trees. Yeah. Van Gogh's olive. Yeah. So it's, it's a little subtlety there. I'm, my mind operates deviously like that. Next. <clears throat> You need space. When you take a picture, it would be great if your tree was here and your backdrop was there. You'd get no shadows on the backdrop. You can do it in a garage. Think about it. Try to get as much space. Unfortunately, he does not have that much space. And I think that tree's pretty heavy. Probably a pain in the neck to move. But try to get as much space between the tree and the backdrop as possible. Next. Clean the bottom. In Asia, they very commonly use a tatami mat, which in Japan, most rooms are basically de defined by how many tatami mats fit in a Japanese room, like a 7 to 12 room tatami mat. They're hard to come by in America. What I ended up doing is I bought a um, straw window shade from Home Depot. And I cut the strings off and I just roll it out on the table and then I clean it up in Photoshop. Next. I love that tree, by the way. That's a pretty nice tree. That just uh, a handheld shot with right lighting and I use Photoshop to clean up the backdrop. You can do a lot in Photoshop. Next. So what I did was notice that I kind of had the camera so you can see the back of the pot and then click it again. That allows me to see again, see how I can see the space in between the pads. Think about that when you're photographing a tree. You want to be able to see your design in its optimum space and you'll have to move the camera up and down to find that. Next. There's another pad. I can't remember how many of these I have. So. So again, when cascade, I mentioned, is a little bit tricky, hit it again. Notice how you can't see the back of the pot. The reason is because the cascade is coming down, you want to have the focal plane of the camera about in the center of mass or maybe a little bit lower than the center of mass to accentuate the cascade. You follow what I'm saying there? Cascade's tricky. Next. And then, you know, you can see the, the delineation of his pads. You can see some of his vertical space. When you can see vertical, I mean, clear space in a tree, the negative space, that makes a small tree look like it's a big tree, because that's what big trees look like. Next. Show ends are really tricky, small trees, because what, which one do you focus on, you know? And so you have to be careful with the depth of field. And in essence, the camera is right about here, emphasizing the, the top one, all right? Now, there's a couple of things that, that immediately, you know, break a lot of the quote rules. Notice there's only a stand on two of the trees, right? I've heard people at the National Exhibition say, you've got to have a stand on there, everyone. No, you don't. Okay? These are repeat species. This is a repeat species. So they say all the species have to be different. You can do whatever you want. It's whatever pleases you. And it, that's fantastic showing exhibition in my mind, right? Next. Again, where the camera angle is and, uh, okay, digital cameras. I think I'm going to skip a lot of this because I think everybody has a digital camera now, right? Nobody uses film anymore, do you? Some people might. Uh, pixels, I just traded or I, I just bought from my brother his old camera and it has twice the resolution of mine. I can't believe how much better the pictures are. The more resolution you can get, the better. Oh, well, I'll tell you what though, these iPhones take great photos too. They have a lot of resolution, uh, almost as much as like a Canon Rebel. It's amazing how good they do, as long as they have light. Next, uh, read some photography magazines. Even though you may not be a photographer, go get a couple just to read what's going on. It'll, I think it'll help you understand photography. Next. Nice thing about digital is you get immediate feedback. I mean, how many times do you take a picture, look and say, ooh, 
I cut the guy's head off, you know, whatever. So you get immediate feedback. Next. Uh, try to get the best camera you can. I think that's all I'll say there. Uh, resolution is how many dots are in the back of the camera. Again, iPhones are pretty good, but digital, digital cameras have gotten phenomenal. Next. The more resolution you have, the more it will let you crop into the picture. And the reason that's important is your tree may be of a position where you can't get the whole backdrop in your picture, but you got the tree in focus. Then you crop it. You know what I mean by cropping? You digitally remove. So the more resolution you have, the better your crop is going to look. If you only have four megapixels, when you crop it, it could be blurry. But if the more you have, it's still going to be pretty sharp in the middle. That's something to keep in mind. Yep. Yep. You, you might be hitting my next chart. Hit the button, will you? No, the lens, but yeah, you're right. Let's skip that one. Uh, depth of field, does anybody know what depth of field is? I need to talk about it. The iPhone is going to do it automatic, but the bottom line is a tree is three-dimensional, okay? So the depth of field, in a picture, you want the whole tree to be in focus. So you're going to have to select the depth of field to do that. You can see here, this butterfly is not in focus, that one, but that one is in focus. That one's in the depth of field. So you kind of play around. What I end up doing is, since I'm working with a tripod, I'll take pictures at different f-stops with my camera. You know what that means? I change the f-stop, and I see, when I download them, which one has the best depth of field. Normally, the smaller the hole, the better the depth of field, the bigger the f-stop number, but means that the shutter speed is going to be open longer. It means you definitely need a tripod. Next. And that's kind of what I just said. These, when you have an f2, you're going to have very limited depth of field. It's great for taking a portrait of a person. You want to just focus normally on their eyes or their face. But when you want a tree, you want f22 if you can get away with it. But f22 is going to need more light. So you're going to need a tripod and light. All right? Go ahead. Sometimes it's interesting to look at the details of a tree. You can use the macro feature and put them on Facebook to impress your friends. Next. Shutter speed, we'll skip that. Let the camera figure that out. White balance. I just want to talk a little bit about white balance. White balance is important with, with the digital camera because it doesn't know what is the real white. So with the iPhone, you can play around with white balance after you take the shot. With most cameras, you can set to the white balance if it's either this type of lighting, outdoor lighting. Pay attention to that. It'll make a big impact on your, on your cameras. It's hard to fix white balance on a, in Photoshop. You can do it, but it takes a lot of work. So that's the wrong white balance. That's too blue, right? Everybody see it's too blue? OK. It's a little bit blurry, too. If you have this feature on your camera, that'll do a pretty darn good job without worrying about what the white balance really is. Just pick auto white balance. But sometimes you still get in trouble. So a couple times, like I was just over in um, Sweden, and I was taking some pictures of landscape, and I knew it was cloudy. So I actually put the camera on, and I got better color, OK? Next, that's what you were just talking about, is uh, RAW versus JPEG. If you're going to be manipulating the images a lot, and if you're not that familiar with cameras, don't even worry about this. But if you want to get experimental, try using RAW. You will get better precision in the pictures. Less, every time a camera gets, an image gets saved as a JPEG, it introduces noise, because the, the software is figuring out what color it should be. It's not the real color. When you take a picture with RAW, it's the actual color that the camera saw. That's the big difference. OK? Is that a setting on the iPhone? No, an iPhone won't take RAW. Okay. Sorry. iPhone does HEIC, which is a pain. That's Apple's proprietary technology, or JPEG. Okay. So if you do JPEG on an iPhone, just save it at high quality. Yeah. That'll introduce less. It takes up more memory in your computer. I mean, this presentation is 208, 275 megabytes. It's because I have all these images. All right, next. Uh, skip that, dot per inch. Uh, digital techniques, don't use the flash, because that's going to create a shadow, burn things out. And when you get these kind of highlights like that, you can't recover from them. It just would take way too much cleanup. Notice how this is blown out. Once something is blown out, you can never recover it in an image. OK, let's go. You know, there's flash versus non-flash. The upper left is the flash. The bottom right, to me, is a much better picture because it doesn't have those nasty shadows in the background. All right? Lighting, uh, basically, I have really cheap lights. I didn't buy anything expensive like that. 
but you side lighting is the best for bonsai trees and just do a little bit of infill. Next. You know, you have to pay attention to the temperatures. I'll just say that incandescent, fluorescent, they're all different temperatures. That's where the white balance comes into play. I know maybe getting to too much detail, so we'll skip over a lot of this. I hope some of it is, is registering, though, because good pictures really make you enjoy bonsai. Next. Sunlight is not a bad thing to take pictures in. Walter Paul is getting pretty darn good results just using the sun. But unless he was trying to get artistic, that picture, that's also a Walter Paul picture. I think he was trying to get artistic. It's, it's an artistic photo, and it is kind of cool, but it's, it's blowing out a lot of the image of the tree. By the way, those are both American trees growing in Germany. That's a ponderosa pine. People say you can't get small needles on them. Somehow Walter Paul does. I have never tried because they won't live in Florida. That's a Rocky Mountain juniper that he somehow got back into Germany. Don't ask me how. Next. Tripod, critical. Doesn't have to be an expensive one. Mine's relatively cheap. But when you're going to use F22, remember F22, that's good depth of field. You're going to need a tripod because the camera shutter is going to be open for maybe 30 seconds. So the camera also has a thing called a uh, remote trigger. So when you hit the remote trigger, the camera will count 10 seconds before it opens the shutter. The reason you do that is no matter how good you are, when you hit the camera, you're going to give it a little bit of a shake. When you do the remote trigger, the camera's nice and steady. You got a good shot. So use the remote trigger, OK? That's right down the bottom. Next. All right, so uh, we kind of talked about all that. Uh, it's, it's, you know, most of those pictures, the tree was centered in the uh, image, right? Remember I said there are a few exceptions when you put the tree in the middle? Whenever you put the tree on a stand, you typically want to put it in the middle of the stand and in the middle of the photograph, all right? Not in a display. Next. Let's skip that. I already talked about digital ma manipulation. So do we need to take a break or do you want to keep going? I have about another 20 minutes. Then we're going to play around with the trees. Everybody okay? I see a couple people thinking about that uh, three-way it's called, you know, they had. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have eaten that. I feel good. All right, what do you think about that image? This is an exhibition. What are some of the opinions? Did I hear a wow? No? If you were to look at any one of those trees individually, you would be blown away. When you make battleship row like that with the Missouri, the Arizona, the West Virginia, they're just good targets for the Japanese, you know? So, in my opinion, I'm over this. I've been to, I don't know, 200 shows probably. And I love the trees, I just hate the display. Look at the stands. Clone, 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 clone. I went to Japan with a friend of mine who's Pretty savvy guy, he's a Wall Street journalist, he won the Pulitzer Prize, and he, he was just getting into bonsai, and we went together, and we were two days at the, uh, uh, the winter one, the uh, Kokufu Ten, and the second day he comes up and he says, if I see another Shimpaka juniper, I'm going to puke. These are world-class trees. But the display was so monotonous, you just, and you know what? I really don't remember any of those trees from that show. None of them really stand out in my mind because the displays were so boring. I mean, this tree was at that show, and I liked it, you know, because it was color, colorful, and I photoshopped it out. So what I'm saying is, I think we, mimicking the Asians, maybe are making a mistake in bonsai display. So let's talk about it. Let's, let's get into this. Because this is controversial. Because Bill Delvanis and Ryan Neal and all these guys are teaching you how to jet. Well, Ryan, maybe not so much. He did do that artisan show in Japan. I mean, in uh, Portland, where they, you know, they had different lighting, and they definitely got away from the Japanese approach. So at the very basic way to display a tree is this right here. It's called a one-point display. It's a nice tree. In fact, I think I judged that tree as the best one in the show that I was at, because so I got to judge that show. And it's on a very nice stand. But do you notice a scroll? Do you notice an accent plant? No. It's the tree. Enjoy the tree for what it is. OK. And that tree stood out in my mind because I really like that hackberry. Next. Uh, notice the stand. And I notice we're short on stands. You definitely need to put trees on stands, okay? particularly when they're not that big. Next. Go ahead. 
All right, this is a two-point display. This was a little display that my friend Dave and I built in Florida. We actually chopped down two slash pine trees, took the bark off and dried them for like six months and made, made this little alcove. We made this temporary alcove for our uh, show in uh, Florida because most of us don't have alcoves, but it's a two-point display. Someone critique it. You've all been to shows before. What do you think about that display? What do you like and what, what you don't like about it? Does he have a stand? Yep. I think the tree carries over to the right side too far. It's slanting too much? Or it maybe needs a bigger uh, space? It's not centered in the frame of the back. So it's, it's the, the angle, maybe it's the photography angle. Um, no, you're right. It was a tough tree to put in that stand because it slants so much. It needs a lot more space is what basically yeah. what you're saying. And I agree. And then the, uh, to me, the little Pier 1 mat on the bottom is kind of tacky looking, right? The way it's wrinkled and stuff. Pier 1 went on there, I think, because they sold them, that the word got out. <laughs> and I don't really know what that thing is on the right. It might be a stone. It might be a, no one gym, it could be a fossil. It could be a weird log. But it's kind of too crowded. You know, it's really not using the golden mean or whatever. But it is a two-point display. And they did have lighting because it was kind of dark. We did, we had lighting. We put that lighting in there. So next. The next one's going to be, what do you think? Three-point display. Very common in a tokenoma, but very uncommon at a bonsai exhibition because rarely do you give the trees the space they need. So a suggestion for you guys, if you want to go more traditional Asian style, is when you're, you're doing a web page, I think I heard, to collect a pic. We just did this for our show next weekend. We, we collected tree information, but we did, and we asked for people for how much room. We're giving the people the space they need. So if they wanted to do a three-point display, they have the space. The worst thing to do is like those poor guys did in, in, um, in Prague. They put their little accent, you know, just on the corner of a stand that wasn't really designed for that. Don't do it. Just get rid of it. Let the tree, it's on a pedestal. It's just like a piece of sculpture. Now that one I think has some mistakes. I, f I don't even know, remember where I took that picture, but it is on a tokenoma mat. So if you were going to do a three-point display at one of your shows, if you could get a tokenoma mat, you can buy them. They are available in the US, they're not cheap. I think one tokenoma mat used to be like 70 bucks, so. But you know, the trees there are worth several thousand dollars anyway. And I believe, you know, that using the golden mean, these, the proportions are really screwed up. This needs to be spread out, this one needs to be over more, and the little one needs to come to the front. Just like you do the golden mean from right to left, you should do the golden mean from front to back, which are different things. Put your biggest one towards the back, put your sec next smallest one, you know, a little bit forward, and then put the little one towards the front. Just makes sense from an aesthetic point. The golden mean has nothing to do with Asia, has nothing to do with America. It's just the way things look pleasing to humans. Next, that was pretty quick, and we're gonna do it in practice back there, all right? Small tree displays are pretty tricky. Um, these are at the National Exhibition. I think this one, the best small tree display. And uh, again, like I said, they, some of the trees have stands. One of the reasons you use a subordinate stand on a big stand like this is so you get different out heights of the different trees. You can see if this stand wasn't here, these trees would be about the same height. Try to have some variety. This one does a pretty good job, although they're three young glaze, you know. Doesn't bother me, but some people will go get anal about it. And, um, you definitely want to pay attention to the angle of the trees. You want the eyes to stay in the composition. So uh, you wouldn't have this tree pointing this way. You know, if that tree was flipped around, it would kind of have a tendency to take your eye off. And then this tree is pretty well positioned because it, it does take you back to the center. And then this tree is kind of pointing that way. So that's a very traditional Asian way to display show entries. Next one. This one's not so traditional. This was my display at one of the national exhibitions. And I actually found this picture online, Jonas Dupich, who's a great artist. He, he kind of liked it. I, and um, although he said this was a block of wood, this is not a block of wood. This is a piece of maple that's actually mitered. It looks like a block of wood because I mitered it. But um, Suthan didn't like it. He thought this was too heavy. I kind of like it because this is an American tree, American elm. That's American maple. And all of these are basically North American trees. And that was kind of my theme, North American show. And if I remember correctly, they're all American pots. Yep, I made that pot. Dale Cochoy made that. Uh, a guy who passed away in Florida, Paul, made that. That's a guy from California. 
Sarah Reina, and Jim Barrett. So that's an All-American display. My, most people probably didn't catch on it. All-American pots, All-American woods, American cherry, American maple, uh, mahogany, I mean uh, black walnut. So it was subtle. It looks like something you might find in a Scandinavian design, right? I think when you're doing a display, you should be motivated by window displays in department stores. And when I want to get inspired to do a display, I Google department window store displays and look at what they have because they're trying to sell stuff. That their money is on the line, right? They do a lot of good stuff. Do that sometime. Google department store window displays, particularly the Christmas ones. The Christmas ones are always good. And that maybe will give you some ideas for doing a display. Okay, next. All right, now the other thing is you have to have a concept. Even when you design a tree like, uh, where, oh, Steve's over there. What did I say when we looked at your boxwood? Let's make this look like a, uh, an oak. a live, oak. live oak. That was our design concept. I said, this one we want to make look like a calligraphy stroke. So never just go into a design willy-nilly when you're designing a tree or when you're designing a display. For this particular one, has anybody read The Last Afternoon of Earth by Brian Aldiss? Great science fiction story, the most profound ending you'll ever read in a science fiction story. He was stationed in Burma during World War II. This book was written about the 60s. And he saw the ficus trees with all the prop roots, you know? And he, he thought eventually ficus trees could take over the world if the world stopped rotating and always pointed to the sun. And that's what happens in his story. You need to read this book. It, I'm telling you, it has the most profound ending you'll ever read in the science of any book, really. And uh, so in my mind, I'm seeing ancient ficus trees taking over the temples. And that was my design goal. I wanted to make the aerial roots a big part of this design. And I call this tree the flying buttress. Next, that's a tokenoma pot, and I made that stand. This particular one, we did a couple of these today. Remember I said, let's yeah. make austerity, right? That was our design goal. It's typically very common for what design? What? The literati, there you go. Literati is the English word. The Japanese word is bunjin. The Chinese word is wenren. And it's basically the calligraphy stroke. And that's why I put the calligraphy stroke on the backdrop of this photo. So that was my design goal. Although being a little bit weird, I decided to call this tree the man in the moon, the crescent moon. You see him down there? Yeah. That's a buttonwood. So you can still have fun with it. And I actually displayed that tree one time. I made its own backdrop. And I made a clock with a little, I got a motor from like um, Rockwell. And I put a cow. Instead of a clock, I had a cow jumping over the moon. And the cow would rotate around, and this little man would pop, the man in the moon popped up. That's the man in the moon. And the cow was jumping over. Most people didn't get it, but that was my design concept. That was an actual display that I had at the Winter Silhouette. Next. Regal. Japanese black pine is always called the king of bonsai, right? And the white pine is the queen of bonsai in Japan from a Japanese point of view. So this, again, is what I call this tree the dragon tail. That was at the National Exhibition a few years ago. I really nailed the needle size on that one, which, by the way, is tough to do in Florida because we don't really have a dormant period. And so it's really tough to get trees. But that one, I'm looking, to, you know, that's the king of my collection. It's a 120-year-old pine tree. Ben Oki told me he thought it was the best pine tree in America, but, you know, he was also, I was also paying him to stay in my house, so you never know. <laughs> but he was a good guy. I love Ben Oki. And it made that stand. And every one of these little dragons like, are on each four side. There's dragons with the Kempinski coat of arms. It was a pain in the neck carving every one of those by hand to be similar. I decided not to do that again anymore. All right, next. Persistence. I already showed you this tree, but this was obviously shaped by a hurricane. Does anybody know the Latin name of buttonwood? It's conocarpus. What's the second word? Erectus. If left alone, this will be a telephone pole. That is not a telephone pole. That got hammered by hurricanes and alligators or whatever. So when I look at that tree, I think of it as persistence, and I would use it in a theme sort of along those lines. OK, next. So the concept is think of the theme of your tree. Here, this was totally inspired in my mind by a hurricane. When Hurricane Francis hit, I went out of my yard, and they were windswept. But you know, windswept normally goes this way, right? Flat to the ground by the ocean. The trees were all going like this because what was happening is the wind was hitting the houses and ricocheting up, and it was taking the branches of the trees on an angle. So if you see that I've kind of bent everything up in that direction. Now, it's got a little bit leggy. That's an American elm. So to me, that's the risk. I was thinking about the risk of what happens in a hurricane if you don't evacuate and that sort of thing. American pot, another stand that I made. 
mystery. This is um, this pine tree just won best pine tree, best forest in Florida. That was our theme of a Florida convention. And each club was supposed to pick their forest, and my club picked that one, brought it in there, and it got it, it picked the best one. And I call it mystery because I call it the Black Forest. Has anybody seen the Black Forest in uh, Germany? Yeah. Why do they call it the Black Forest? The trees grow so close together. It's black on the bottom, and it's pretty dark in the bottom of that uh, tree in real life. And actually, I have a problem because I get uh, ferns growing in there, which I don't want. It means I'm getting too much water. So again, that was the design concept. I was thinking of the black forest, and I want the trees to be pretty dense. And it worked. The next. <coughs> Fecundity is a good concept. Great for trees that make fruit, you know? Because when you think about it, trees are sexual entities. They're flowers, a male, female. They're reproducing. They're trying to survive like a bougainvillea. The best way to get a bougainvillea to flower is to not give it water. It thinks it's going to die. It'll make flowers. The flower's a little white thing. The color thing is the brac. And then give it water, fake it out. When it thinks it's dying, it wants to reproduce to, to keep its species going. Uh, so that was a uh, teeny little uh, pyracantha. Elegance. See that branch is gone? Remember I told you I did the diagnostic work on that tree? You can just see the scar. I think it looks a lot better. It's it probably a little bit too flat here. I probably should get a little wire on that guy to get it down. But I, to me, it's just an elegant triple trunk. Next. <coughs> Call this one history because my dad worked for the Port Authority for many years. He was a policeman. He retired. He died in 99, so he didn't see the World Trade Center happen. But to me, after the World Trade Center happened, these are the World Trade Center right here. And that's all the subordinate billing. And that's what motivated me to make that forest. And the most ironic thing is seven years into its life, I had to cut down an oak tree in my yard. And I didn't know what I was doing. And instead of going this way, it went that way. And it took out the World Trade Center. Isn't that wild? So it was almost like a premonition. It actually totally destroyed the whole planning. That the, I made that thing out of concrete. This, and this is the one where I had to splice two photos together to fit them on the stand. The stand wasn't big enough. Next. Time, I think time is a really interesting concept because you know, without entropy, you don't have time. So I made a time machine. That thing is a time machine. It's, an, it's the computer from an antique gas pump. And you can actually turn those levers and it makes that, does anybody remember when the gas pumps would go ding, ding? This thing does that. So when I put it in a show, I turn and it makes a ding and I said, we're setting it for the future time or the back time. And, and people actually encourage people to do it. And it's just junk that I bought at a swap meet and I made it look kind of like steampunk. And then what's really neat is I found this piece of fabric at a fabric store. It looks like French or Italian or Latin, but it's neither. It's just scribbles like a future language. And people have actually stood there and tried to translate it. And I've gotten more compliments on a time machine display. Does that look like anything in that first display I showed you in Japan? No. And you know what? People still talk to me about the time machine display. It's stuck in their mind because the display was evincing an emotional concept. OK, next. This one was really interesting. This is a three-dimensional shadow box that I built. So when you look in here, this is a building, right? But nothing is at a right angle. All the angles, this thing's only this deep. All the angles are going to the perspective point. OK, and that's the Brooklyn Bridge in the background. I built that because my mom, during World War II, worked for the Scrib Company, making pharmaceuticals, first aid kits. And she could see the Brooklyn Bridge from her office, you know, where she worked. But everyone else says, that's something else. What do you think they say that is? It's a famous novel. Anybody? A tree grows in Brooklyn? You ever hear of that? Everyone said, oh, it's a tree grows in Brooklyn. That's not what I was thinking of. But you know what? I was OK with that. By the way, this is a 116 scale car. That's a 143rd scale car. So even the cars that look, even though they're only about this far apart, it looks like that car's way off in the distance because it's a different scale. So you can do a lot of creative stuff when you're displaying. We're going to show some more examples now. I still have that thing in my garage. I really need to get rid of it because it's taking up a lot of space. I've used it a couple times. This was a really simple one. I bought that suitcase on eBay for 20 bucks. I put a shelf in it. I got some maps and some foreign coins. And I said, going on the road. You know, it's a real simple display. You can do, anybody's free to use this concept at your show. It's easy to pull off. Next. This one took a lot of work. 
This was at the Silhouette Show a few years ago, and my goal was an apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic Chinese wax factory. And so this was a vat that would, and I, have, I melted a lot of candles on that thing, and this was a wooden container. I made pots just for the show. And by the way, this happens in Japan. They take the trees out of the pots they're growing in, and they put them in the antique pots just for the show, and they'll rent a pot for a lot of money just for the show. In this particular case, that would never live in that pot. It's made out of fiberboard and, and plywood. These are PVC pipes that I weathered. Got some electrical boxes over there. And, and if you read this, there's some comedy in this. I won't say what it says. You'd have to read Chinese, but it's, it's kind of like making fun of a Chinese menu. And um, some people said the graffiti was supposed to be saying art, but it was actual Chinese graffiti that I found online. And I replicated it. And I don't really know what it says. And, this is the, when you have, anybody in the industry know what an orange pipe in a factory is? It stands for some type of hazardous gas. So the whole idea was you're now looking, humans are gone, and their equipment's being taken over by trees. And somebody at the show wrote me a letter about this display. And they left it underneath the display, and when I picked it up, they were, whereas the traditionalist hated it. I won't mention who they were. They said, oh, it's a disgrace, blah, blah, blah. You're throwing, you know, they saw me throwing it away when I thought it was done. It was just scenery. It's a window display done for the show to make an artistic point. Okay? Next. This one's interesting. There's a famous painting called Ruggiero Rescuing um, Angelica. I think I might have it on the next slide. Would you hit the next slide? Yeah, that's the painting by Dominic Ingress. And so, I don't know how we go back, but in essence, the tree is Angelica. Uh, can you go backwards? Yeah, I did. Yeah, so this, this is, Ange oh. whoops, that's Angelica. This is the knight, I painted him in oil. And Sonny Boggs put the dragon up there. It's a really cool pot. When I saw that pot, I knew immediately I was making this display. And then I made this, this is actually rosewood that I got from a hurricane that um, knocked over the tree and I took it to a sawmill, made it roast, but you could do it with any kind of wood. So again, totally non-traditional, referencing European art, okay? And it's, you know, she's not naked, so it's better. And they make the painting, they always make her, she was being sacrificed to a pagan god and, and that night saved her. All right, next one, show in display. Why do you have to use a box stand, okay? Does anybody know what Hachi no Ki means? Hachi means pot, no means tree in a pot, it means bonsai. It's the only no play, no is the uh, Japanese uh, theater, there's kabuki, which is the one where they change costumes, it's all male, no is the more traditional one. It's the only no play that involves bonsai trees. And what it is is, this lord is having hard times, this is his wife, he's out, this monk comes by and visits her, and it's cold, and she says, come on in. So, you know, we'll give you what we have. We don't have much. He comes back and he says, what are you doing? You know, we don't have anything. She says, oh, it's okay. Well, we're freezing. He says, let's burn our best bonsai trees. This is the lesson of self-sacrifice, right? So they burn their best bonsai trees for the monk. The monk is very grateful. He goes about his business. A couple weeks later, there's a call to arms. There's an invasion. And this poor samurai who's down on his luck, his armor's rusty, his horse is old, He's going to go fight for his lord. He goes to, to the call to arms, and it turns out the monk is actually the daimo, the lord of the area. He was dressed up as a monk to see what was going on. And he recognizes the lord and gives him back his land. And so that's a famous no play. That was the theme of that display. And so I had to put a web page on that little paper because nobody knew what I was talking about. It was too esoteric. But I bet you that would go over big in Japan because they would know immediately what I was talking about. Next. And I drew all those on, on fiberboard. Being a science fiction, you know, we need to hit the button one more time. This, to me, is from the 50s and 60s. Anybody remember those magazines, amazing stories? So what I have here is a meteorite, which is a limestone rock with two Japanese black pines growing on it. I actually made a pot that looks like a rocket ship. And I have a rod that goes into the pot, and is, this is actually a piece of fiberboard, so it's rigid. And it's suspended in midair. This is suspended in midair. And then I you know, cut these letters out and put earth. So this is the kind of stuff that I'm doing for creative displays. And you know what? 
People talk to me about this one all the time. This one, I like the concept of entropy, being a scientist, it's the degree of disorder. And so the theme here was that you have order here, and as you go this way, you get more disordered. So here you have kind of a formal upright tree and a very nice stand. This is a Neobuxifolia. Here you have a Japanese black pine exposed root. The stand is actually a piece of rotten maple that's just falling apart. And so again, the concept is order to disorder. And on the side of this thing, I actually wrote the equation for entropy, but again, nobody caught that because I'm a nerd. But uh, proud of it. Next. All right, now, Robert Steven, you guys know him? I went to his show in Indonesia. There were actually two shows back to back. There was a traditional Indonesian show, who they're at, end, they're at odds with Robert. I don't know the details, I don't want to get into it. I got enough with American politics to worry about Indonesian politics, bonsai politics. But he decided to get artists together with bonsai artists to put on a display. And these are some of the photos. There was probably 500 displays at this show. It was phenomenal. And I got to stay at the, they were going to put me up at some cheap hotel, and I said, they didn't look that good. So it turns out they had a Radisson. It was the nicest hotel I've ever stayed. And I paid for it myself. But they had a golf course, which put me in seven heaven. Played golf, went to the display. Really had a good time. So what is happening here? I have no idea. I don't know what the artist was doing, but he's got these Indonesian samurai guys, and very few Indonesians look like that. This guy's butt's hanging out. And then they got this fancy tree, you know, and this is still being set up, so you see some compressors. Let's look at the next one. Um, this is just one of 500. This one is relatively simple, right? They, they didn't really take it out of the pot or anything, but they did a graffiti backdrop, and they put it on bricks. So it's, and then, you know, they didn't bother with the two or three point display. Pretty good, I think, right? I, li I like the colors. That, I think, is a, either a Premna or a Pemphis, I can't remember. I have a lot of premnas. I brought premnas back into the United States. I'm, I'm the premna king of, uh, it's one of my favorite trees. I should probably send some to you guys. Just try them up here. But it's a very tropical tree. Next. How about that one? Look at the thought behind that. Pretty impressive, huh? I, I guarantee you, I remember that a lot more than I remember a Kokufu Ten winning pine tree in Japan. I hate to say it, but it's true. Because there's a lot more thought to do that display. I would never make a piece of furniture out of polyurethane. I would use, you know, lacquer or something. But for a bonsai stand, polyurethane, if you do happen to scratch it, just take some fine sandpaper, 400 grit, sand it lightly, and put another coat of polyurethane. Good as new. You know, I, know I had a scratch on one of my stands at the National. My guy was saying, oh, you scratch your stand. He said, yeah, I won't be there tomorrow. I said, what do you mean? I said, I'm going to sand it out and put polyurethane <laughs> on it tonight. Oh, really? I didn't know that. I make my own stand, so I know what I'm doing. So, all right, so let's. Let's just move these for the time being, okay? Let's assume that they were, you were given this table with what, what you have. Well, let me play around with what you got you, here, okay? I just brought little... And please excuse the mess. Sorry. So, um, <laughs> we're going to have to use our imagination, okay? So we have a forest and a round pot on a square stand. That's pretty good. And um, with that, Iliagnus, I like Iliagnus. I have, I actually sold a bunch of mine because they're in demand they're at the United States, but let's put this one over here. This is, let's make believe this stand's a little bit bigger, a little bit taller, okay? This is stand, and this is kind of a, um, this looks like uh, a, a kitchen store cutting board type stand, okay? It's okay. Um, you know, not everything has to look like an Asian stand. As you see, I did a Scandinavian design. So if that was just a little bit taller, this tree is going this way. One thing about this tree, whose tree is that? Is that yours, Stephanie? Am I looking at the front? I can't decide. No. No. Now that, I, now that I've looked at the tree, I think maybe yeah, that's, the that's the front. Right. All right, so if that's the case, we got to play a musical table here. Sorry. What you do is, I actually have a big barbecue outside my house that's you know, concrete, and when I do these things, I play around. And I've seen them do this in Japan. I watched, uh, and Mr. Um, Kantos is a, the chief trainer of the apprentices, had these apprentices bring in like 20 different accent plants before he was happy. But you know what? He didn't have a concept. So what is the concept of this display? You just want to show some of your nice trees, right? Right. What's the emotional construct you're trying to make? So here's what I would do. I really don't have Since this is, 
since um, I grab some things. Right. But that what I'm trying to get is let's not just, just grab stuff anymore. Let's come up with an idea first. I love this tree on this stand because I think it's a little bit non-traditional and ooh, I'm non-traditional. Can you believe that? So since this has kind of a Euro look to me, or like, you know, because it's got, it's definitely modern with that. What you need to find is um, something that's going to bring out that color blue. I would probably go with, um, if you had an accent pot, that's not blue. This is blue. This is blue, right? Yes. So if you had a small something, um, either a little flat piece of wood or something even more glass-like, because that's glass, it doesn't have to be a tree, okay? Mm -hmm. It could be uh, a cool piece of glassware from your house. Uh, I've used, in one display that recently, I used a um, brass statue of the Hindu god um, Ganesh, the elephant head, which has got a great story if you don't know it. His dad chopped his head up because he got jealous, and the mom said, give him his head back. He didn't give him the head back, he gave him an elephant's head. Now this god is stuck in perpetuity with an elephant's head. But go with something blue glass. Doesn't even have to be a bonsai tree. Find something, a little knickknack or whatever that has a blue glass, and, and keep it tight. You don't even have to worry about This is its own little universe. That, that's a pretty nice... Well, can I ask a question? Yeah. The distance between the accent plant and the tree, and I noticed it on some of these. To me, my aesthetic or whatever, I wouldn't be having so far apart, so I'm wondering what the thinking is behind Well, that. I mean, what size of your table is going to be in your show? Uh, what these are six foot tables, I think. Are our six foot tables? tables? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a six foot table, uh, I noticed most of you so far seem to have smaller trees in Florida, probably why I got a hernia. We have bigger trees. Six foot table could really only be one tree on a small little thing. Mm -hmm. Eight foot table, which is what we have, you could do the traditional two point display or, or you could put my big shadow to the course perspective off. For a six foot table, <coughs> Go to the golden mean. Now the golden mean of this. Okay, you actually get a tape measure embedded in. This has to be compelling. It needs to be something blue glass. It would be a phenomenal, subtle display, in my opinion. You're not trying to show everything. The problem that, that some of the people in my club, like we did this last month for my club because we have a show next weekend. And this one lady brought in a little Japanese screen and she had she had like seven things on the table. I said, what's your story? You look like an antique shop, you know? Is that your story? Well, if you want to make an antique shop, put little signs, it, it's just, it is a concept. You could do it. I'm not saying it's wrong. But here, this is much more elegant, particularly that is such a cool color. If you could somehow replicate that in something, and it's easy to pop an X in. If you had like a little glass um, something, you know. Uh, I've got stone slices I'll put under there with your. Stone slice? Is it blue like that? Yes. I'd like to see a picture of that posted on Facebook so I can see. I think that's elegant enough. This tree has got enough on its own. I would get rid of the guy wire. I heard. <laughs> you know, I was when I was judging this big show in Italy, all the trees had guy wires, and there was this one um, Spanish uh, Scots pine, super small needles, phenomenal tree, no guy wire. Gave it the top prize after I ordered it. It had one little guy wire in the back, but you know what? I didn't see it, so it wasn't that big a deal. But I think this tree stands on its own. I would clean this moss off of here. I would moss the soil if you can get hold of moss, and then it's with your show is when? October. Okay, you got time. I would lime sulfur this. Uh, lime sulfur when you first put it on will be yellow because it's got sulfur in it. Um, let it dry. By October it should dry. If it doesn't turn white, hit it with vinegar. Spray it with just a little bit of vinegar, and then, believe it or not, go get some white acrylic craft paint. And you know what dry brush technique is? Mm -hmm. You put the paint on the brush, you get a scrap piece of paper, you get rid of almost all the paint, and then gently go over the grain and only highlight the, the upper part of the grain. <laughs> you can, this is, remember, this is an exhibition. People say bonsai is natural. There is nothing natural about a bonsai. Every tree I showed you in there will not look like that in nature. You show me a Japanese black pine that looks like a formal upright in Japan in the wild, they don't exist. They are all stylized man's represent or human's representation of what they think a tree should look like. Okay? So by using a little bit of paint, so you definitely gotta get rid of this. 
You want to cover the moss up. You definitely don't want the securing wires exposed, and you don't want any gun wires. The wiring on the branches is okay. I'm okay with that. And, and that's why copper, is, that looks like copper. It is copper. That's why copper has a big advantage over aluminum. Aluminum wire, when it stays on a tree, will oxidize and turn white, and it gets really ugly. Copper wire oxidizes and turns brown, almost evaporates, not evaporates, but disappears. All right? So that's one concept. I kind of like this as a very simple because the tree can stand on its own. Uh, for this one on a six foot table, I would make this a supplement. That's what it is, actually. Yeah. So this is a secondary tree, and maybe we're going to make believe we have a stand. Um, so the theme for this one, uh, again, traditional two point display. Uh, in October, that should still have leaves, right? Yeah, that's but they're going to be yellow. I hope. Probably. No. Not by October? No. Oh, shucks. You don't get leaves changing in October? Not until the end of October. End of October. Oh, wow. October. Okay. Yeah. Of course, well, leaves shucks. Change there goes that idea. But actually, that's a great pot for when they do change. Because the leaves will be yellowish orange, and that's on the opposite side of the color wheel. I didn't really talk about the color wheel today from blue, but that's a nice little compliment. So I would make that the secondary tree. And um, since that's a temperate tree, and uh, I would go with a conifer over here. You have a bigger conifer? Mm -hmm. I go with a bigger conifer. And they're and blue. What do you mean they're blue? Japanese white pines, but they're a lot more than Okay, Japanese blue. white pine would work, because that's, that's an Asian species. And then your theme could be the fall. Mm -hmm. Put some little accent down here that's going to bring out the fall. It could be a pumpkin. Doesn't have to be a tree. It could be a little oblong thing with some acorns on it and some dried out leaves. Get creative. Mm -hmm. Don't always think it has to be an accent plant uh, or whatever, you know? It could be an apple, you know? Well, I have this, but it's gold. Would that work? And then I have some brown. Not creative enough. You, you got the, I can tell you got the potential to be creative. And I know he does. Just listen to your husband once. How many, how many families would be better if the woman listened to their men? I know my wife never says that. That's not going on the internet, I hope, is it? Yeah, it is. All right, let's, let's play with some of these over here. So, um, all right, we want to do the Kentucky thing. Let's start giving Brandon. How many people like Kentucky? I don't want to start a civil war. I live in Kentucky. Right. We got a lot of Kentucky. Kentucky. Woo! So let's what is that? Oh, I think it's a book. Uh, yeah. Book no, I didn't see that. It's they've got great basketball teams, you know. Yeah. Maybe not so good at football, but yeah. basketball is pretty good. Hey, so they have winning football seasons now. We talk. They have a really good season. <laughs> I've kind of lost track of uh, all sports. I don't even pay attention to the professional golf anymore. All right, so what can we do with Kentucky? He said a blue pot. So where's the blue pot? All right, we need a stand. That's a blue pot. This is going to be a J. The J needs a little bit of a haircut. We can, we can do that. Uh, let's talk about the movement of this J. All right, so we're going non-traditional. So I'm looking for ideas. Can we get Kentucky blue table pots? <laughs> Not for our show. What's it going to be? They're all going to be the same. They're all going to be the same. You won't allow that. Uh, well, I, it's never come on, up before. But you could put something over top. You could put it on top. Yeah. Don't ever allow someone. When I hear not allowed, that my alarm bell goes off and says, this is happening. You know? <laughs> the, uh, the Florida show said, you got to submit your trees and they got to be over. I said, no, it doesn't. And I just brought in what I wanted, you know? Um, <laughs> and what are they going to do? Send me to jail, right? Uh, you didn't, she didn't like what I'm saying, but... No, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Well, I didn't know. No, let me clarify. I didn't say it wasn't allowed. I said it had not come up. We've always had the All right, how about this? I'm this, all for getting creative. The, um, since Kentucky is known for basketball, and he's got all these Final Four things, we can go with Final Four and maybe a backdrop. A basketball-related backdrop. Either a photo of the stadium or whatever. And maybe, in addition to the shoes here, uh, you know, I mean, it depends on how far out you want to get. Um, this doesn't really look good just by itself. This, you need to integrate something with that. Do you have a square pot? Where, there you are. If you had something with a square pot that could go up against that, like it's integrated, that might work. Or maybe you don't use this now that we're running with the theme. You put your backdrop. Uh, this is going to sound crazy. Cut a basketball in half. 
I'm not saying do it. Cut a basketball in half and make that your container for your next basketball. Or, yeah. or, but don't make it a regulation size basketball because that would be too big with that pop. So you can find at the five, they, they call them five below in Florida. Do you have them here? Yeah. Right? This is blue. It might be too big. It might not be appropriate for that. But yeah, I mean, it would, that would work actually with that size tree. Okay? So the stand, that, since you don't have a lot of stands, why don't you go with just a simple box that you put paper on? Just put blue paper on the Kentucky blue paper or whatever. That way you don't have to start doing learning woodworking. You could just get a simple box covered with paper. Remember, it only has to last a couple days. It's for an exhibition. I've, I've spent hundreds of dollars on stuff and then just threw it away after the show. But, you know, I'm committed to the art. So uh, obviously you're going to have to trim this guy down. We can work on this one when I'm at your house if you want. Um, I'm not sure this is going to work. This flat, this thing is a problem, you know. It's designed, but wait a minute, Kentucky yearbooks, right? You could actually, like I had those maps, you could maybe do something with books. I'm trying to get you guys to really think outside the box. Some of this stuff may be stupid idea, but try it. Try it in your house, in the privacy of your home, where no one's going to arrest you for insanity. If it works, <laughs> fine. If not, don't do it, you know? So try a, a hoop up on its, uh, I'll, I'll hoop on its. Upright, like a. Um, mm -hmm. He's got a. Where's Steve? He's got a basketball hoop that nobody's using in his backyard. Yeah. <laughs> so it looked yeah, like it was a little bit bent too. If I yeah, it, it hasn't. It might. My, my kids moved away. He's going to be out of town for a ago. while, Brendan. All right. Yeah. Yeah. This, yeah. This is a pretty cool tree. Yeah. I don't know if you guys ever heard of Jim Smith. This was Jim Smith's favorite species, the Port Macquarie apple, and he'd been growing them for 60 years. He had some amazing ones. And now they're at the uh, in the Heathrow Botanical Garden. Let's talk about some of the stuff that someone brought in over here. This um, let's okay. So what do we have here? We got uh, looks like somebody stole this from a diner. It's like a sugar thing, right? It's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's just oh, I can say we're not going to get the FBI looking for us now, right? <laughs> so what were you thinking? Here? Who brought well, you brought I brought this I brought this in just because we did have some trees last year that had no dressing on them. They were just like dirt. So I thought maybe we could talk about different things that can be used to dress the soil. Okay, that's soil. true. Um, uh, how hard is it for you guys to come up with moss? Easy. Easy. It's not hard. Right? Not hard, okay. I mean, i tell you what our moss factories are about for If you go, yeah, well, they're always irrigated, you know? So if you, and if you get off the fairway, either on the edge of a creek or something, you're probably gonna find moss on a golf course. That's where I get most of my moss from. And then I propagate it. And I have micro sprinklers, uh, you know, the little sprinklers that pop in. So um, one thing you can do, can I make a little bit of a mess? Sure, absolutely. So one thing you can do if you don't have a stand, move that, I don't want to get that dirty. Yep. I'm really down on scrolls for exhibitions. Okay, I know some people love them, but to me, a scroll is being a whole certain thing in Asia. And when we use a scroll, it's kind of like using a sledgehammer maybe to pound in a nail or a screwdriver put in a nail, you know, we're not, we don't really know what we're doing with that scroll. It's just like I did the Hachi no Ki, unless you knew what I was talking about, it went right over your head, and a lot of us are probably doing like, let me have galoshes for lunch. You know, when you order, I did that one time in a restaurant, I ordered something really weird, they looked at me. But if you don't have a stand, and say you have a small tree like this, and can I borrow the little black one? This one, the, the dark colored one. So this is a good sized tree for this stand. You don't have a lot of other stands, a little bit narrow, I mean a little bit not wide enough, but pretty good in that size, okay? If you want to get creative and you have some knickknacks like this, uh, we're, this is going to make a mess. All right. It needs to be darker. This is darker, okay? So let's just put that down. Get a little tiny brush. I have a really cool one. I helped Mr. Kobayashi wire a tree in Indonesia, and he gave me this handmade brush that he made. It is so cool. And I keep it in my bonsai bag. I didn't bring it because I didn't want to lose it. I always end up Where losing it. Where are the bristles? I don't know. It's some kind of dark brown bristles. Okay, take that. Take your little tower. It's a really cheap way to make a very simple display, you know? You need a little more sand and you can make it into like a kidney shape or whatever. So 
you could do a concept of a beach. A buttonwood would be good for this display. Okay, so you have a buttonwood, which is a beech tree, next to a sand type thing. I'm not so sure about the Asian tower. I just used it because that's what we had. But um, how about a small rowboat? Like uh, was washed up on the shore in Key West, where the buttonwoods grow. Mm -hmm. So you have a buttonwood on a stand, a little bit of sand, and a little rowboat. Your concept is you're replicating Key West, you know? If you wanted to do Asia, and you use a little uh, pagoda here, okay? I've seen several of these pagodas in Japan and China. I wouldn't go with a ficus tree. I would go with uh, a Japanese species, which would be, that's too big for that stand, but since, let's assume that we have the right stand for this one. This one, in my opinion, for this display, would have to be a flat, shallow stand, kind of like when I showed you Battleship Row, all those trees were on shallow stands. You could use that. This reminds me a little bit of the volcanic islands I see in Japan. And there would be another island nearby, potentially with people going on it. So your, your reference there, in my opinion, either Key West is going to be a volcanic island in Japan. Right? And uh, you don't need a scroll. You, you can do it just with those two things like that. about moss. Sometimes you see people piecing moss together and it's different varieties of moss. It looks like a jigsaw puzzle. And sometimes you see people that have the same color, same type of moss. It's just a one, it's like one solid that you're right long way from. Moss. No, it's just personal preference. Uh, up north, you have a lot more varieties of moss and lichen than we have. We being Florida. We get moss like this. And we get one other, that's really not moss, that's a weed, that's uh, Scottish, uh, oh, Scottish moss, I think. All right. And so, I mean, it's okay for, for a show, but you don't want to let the tree grow with that. Yeah, I forget the name of it. Obviously, for the show, this moss has to be removed, and the roots would have to be, this show, may, this tree may not be actually great for a show, it needs a little more refinement, but you would put some moss here, and maybe since you're doing the beach thing, you could continue some of that beach sand over here. I have been to Tanagashima Island where they launched the rockets. It's just like a James Bond movie set. They got this beautiful volcanic island, a beach, and a modern launch pad. I swear I saw Doc Bono there, you know? And that they launched because it's a southern island and they get the best uh, payload to geosynchronous. But this is sort of, in my mind, so now, if you really want to be crazy, and I can mail you one, I have the H2 rocket. It's about that big. I have a little model of the H2 rocket the Japanese gave me. And you could do, you could actually, in October, you could safely take that tree out of that spot, put it in a sand composition with another beach here, and put the rocket. And I don't know if Brandon's hearing this or not. This is, this is getting crazy. What I'm basically saying is, I have the H2 rocket. That's the Japanese rocket that goes into orbit. Okay. It's only about this big. I think I have two of them. I can mail you one. You could take I'll this you tree. Do. You could take this tree in October safely out of its pot. Don't mess with the roots. <coughs> I did that that big ficus tree, and I took it out of the pot. Mm. Ficus, you could do that anytime. Mm. And make a beach, make a beach, and simulate Tanagashima Island where they launched their rockets. Okay. It's like a James Bond set. Or you want to remove this. Before you go any further, if that's part of the land mass, isn't it? This is elevated. Well, I think the roots would look better exposed. I mean, I think he, he has that there. More roots. Yeah, he has that there, so the roots are growing. This this tree really isn't ready for a show yet, in my opinion. Now, remember, the first thing I said is the tree's got to look good. It's got to be ready. I'm just talking about ideas. Right. But to me, when I'm seeing this, uh, and in reality, I need to flip it because if this was pruned properly, you would see this rock. And so the tree's really going that way. It needs to be on this side. Again, artistic principles, which way is it directing your eye? But that whole composition to me is reminding me of the, now you could really get a little more crazy. And I've, uh, I've done a doc, uh, James Bond display. <laughs> Take the James Bond Dr. No theme a little further and maybe get a movie backdrop. And uh, they, they do have models of the James Bond stuff, maybe use an Aston Martin or whatever, I don't know. I mean, these are the kind of things you'd think of, go through, don't just think, simple three-point display with a scroll. It's okay, but you know what? It's been done for 50 years in the United States now, it's boring. It's not gonna really stand in anybody's mind. 
If you go to Val Vanis' show, yeah, you're not going to win any award, but you know what? You're having fun. You're, and don't do it just for the award. Do it for what makes you happy and what is making you creative. And I'm doing this all without medication, okay? <laughs> I can do this, you can do it. <laughs> we can tell you skipped it this morning. <laughs> no, I, my hip is getting sore though, it's just Tylenol, you know? So I am falling apart. It's the goal. I think I've kept you guys here long enough. I think yeah. you got the message, right? Yeah, it's a really good Concept, yeah. think outside the box. Even with your simple stuff, you can do some cool things. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Maybe I'll come up to your show, who knows? I think in October I'm pretty committed though. We'll send you pictures. Yeah, put them on Facebook. Yeah. I'll, to, I'll join, I'll get onto your web page. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, that's it for tonight. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Hope you all enjoyed it.